This lecture is about public opinion and campaign politics. Uh, I'm going to go through the same three measurements of uh, uh, public opinion as in the previous two lectures, as you can see on the notes already, and talk about how each of these is used by or impacts uh, the behavior of campaign strategists. Um, I mentioned this in an earlier lecture, but one of the things that uh, you can, uh, where you can get more information about how public opinion impacts campaign politics is from the assigned novel, uh, 1994, a novel of politics, the novel that I wrote, which is part, uh, it's not assigned for any specific week, it's, it's connected to uh, the paper that's due at the end of the course. Uh, I hope you're already uh, reading that book because it will. Uh, it, it isn't just uh, necessary for that particular paper. It is necessary for that paper, but it is. It was intended. I wrote it to be entertaining. I wrote it also to reveal what a campaign looks like. But I did also write it to show how it is that uh, measurements of public opinion, particularly uh, internal campaign polls, impact the way campaign strategists uh, make decisions and. Uh, 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 structure and uh, organize their campaigns. So again, I'm referring to this uh, uh, that I'm not going to say everything in this particular lecture because there's plenty of stuff in the possibly more dry passages in the book at least that cover what it is that campaign strategists do with the kinds of data that they get. Um, so one thing to note is that public opinion measurements are a resource for campaign strategists. Uh, campaign strategists are operating in a highly competitive environment, right? You're running against one or more other candidates, all of whom have access to, to uh, information, all of whom are raising money and trying to drum up support for their candidates and advertising and uh, having rallies and, and all this stuff. Everyone's doing the same thing, trying to win. Um, and public opinion measurements can be an extremely valuable resource for figuring out how to do the other things, where to send candidates, what kind of messaging to have, whether to advertise on Facebook or on radio, um, what kinds of uh, appeals are going to uh, get to the voters that we haven't convinced yet, who are the persuadable voters and what will persuade them. Um, these are things that campaign strategists, they want answers to these questions. They need and have to seek answers to these questions. Um, prior to the 1990s, there, were, there was polling um, and it was semi-useful, but campaign strategists really relied more on a combination of traditional practices and like personal intuition. Um, campaigning was really kind of an instinctual, gut instinct, experience-based endeavor. Starting in the 80s and really uh, getting uh, uh, you know rapid growth in the 90s were data-driven strategists, and now today that's basically what we have. There are we don't have uh, campaign managers, campaign strategists, uh, who are just going on their gut and doing things, uh, traditional methods. Um, there are some traditional methods that have survived, right? You know, getting people to go door to door with campaign literature and connecting with voters one on one, at least, of course, prior to the pandemic when you could still do this, those methods are still used. So uh, data driven strategy has not replaced traditional methods of campaigning. What it has done is it has given strategists and campaign managers the ability to better know what to do, how to use traditional methods like advertising and rallies and uh, flyers and face-to-face -face contact. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a valuable resource and not using this information is uh, puts you at a severe disadvantage and largely you're such a severe disadvantage that you're probably, unless you have a super safe seat, you're not going to win the election without uh, this valuable resource. So this is one of the ways in which the public opinion industry is actually an essential component of the modern democratic system. It's providing information to candidates. Um, now, the different measurements provide different kinds of information. Issue and attitude surveys, which include approval ratings, um, they show the landscape of the campaign, right? And uh, candidates and campaign strategists, they can rely on public polling uh, to tell them what the public thinks, what the electorate cares about this particular cycle, what side of the different important issues that are uh, you know, up at the top of people's uh, brains what which side has stronger support and what that lets you know is how can i orient my candidate towards the world as it the electoral world as it exists right now um, for sure 
if you know that people care about policing reform in a way that they didn't care about it before because, you know, concern for this issue has risen from, you know, mid-level to top two or three issues in people's minds, and pu public opinion polls are definitely these days showing that that is the case. If you don't talk about policing reform, you're not going to have a very successful campaign. Um, if that issue drops away from the public's attention and becomes less important than, say, the economy or if there's uh, a terrorist uh, scare, the national security, and you don't see that data and respond to that change and continue hammering uh, at the messaging surrounding police reform, you're going to have a less successful campaign than a campaign that uses that and responds to it. Um, what do people care about? What do they, where do they stand on the issues? Also, where is their movement? Where is their possible movement? Where is their soft support? Um, where can, what issues can we come at hard to persuade persuadable voters? Um, some campaigns will actually do issue and attitude surveys even prior to starting their campaigns, prior to starting their uh, internal ballot preference polls, which are an, an absolute necessity and, and a key tool that every campaign needs. Um, even prior to doing that, who are you going to vote for, right? The, the campaigns will ask, and potential campaigns, people who aren't even sure they're going to get in the race, will find out what is public opinion in the area that I'm going to be voting, or excuse me, that I'm going to be running, the voters that I'm specifically, I'm going to potentially run for governor of Oregon. Uh, I can't just look at the Gallup polls of what Americans think. I need to have polling on Oregon, and maybe the, the most important issues that exist right now uh, there's not enough polling data from these reputable national uh, organizations on Oregon that will tell me what the landscape looks like. And so campaigns will sometimes commission their own internal issue or attitude surveys as a way of getting a better picture of what the basic landscape of the campaign looks like. What's the environment? What's the political environment in this particular election cycle at this moment going forward for the next couple of months? What does it look like? Um, and as I say in the notes, it helps frame the campaign narrative. You, 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 just want, you can't just run the same campaign no matter what the environment looks like. Uh, and I actually think that's one of, the, one of the problems that the Trump campaign may be facing is that Donald Trump wants to run the same kind of campaign that he ran in 2016. And there's two problems with that. One is that the world of 2020 is very different from the world of 2016. And two, he's in a very different position. He was an outsider, insurgent, dis, you know, uh, disaffected candidate. Now he's the president of the United States. People expect different things from the president than they expect from somebody running from the outside. So when you're running for re-election, you can't I mean, you can try, but it doesn't typically serve to run as an outsider because you're not really an outsider. Um, what, uh, you know, so but basically even, try, even a successful campaign in the past can't necessarily be duplicated when you're running for re-election. Um, same thing was true for Tea Party candidates, right? When they ran in 2010, they ran on a, a platform of change. And then once you're in Congress, now you have to run, at least to a certain extent, on a platform of accomplishment. Um, and it, that becomes a different kind of election. And e even if uh, even if voters don't really care about that, the people's concerns change. Uh, current events change in their lives. Uh, the political landscape is constantly shifting. All right. Uh, both external horse race polls and internal polls are both ballot preference type polls. Um, and each of these two types of polls does a different thing for a campaign. Um, the external polls are actually, uh, they are useful-ish, but really what they are is they form part of the electoral landscape that you can't change. They frame the campaign narrative from the outside of the campaign because these polls, the published polls, show who's winning and by how much. Um, and uh, campaigns have to be responsive to that, right? You could be confident your internal polling could show that you're doing really well with the key swing voter groups that you need to win the election. But if the publicly available polling shows you down by 10 points, that's a narrative that you have to respond to. You can't, uh, I mean, you can, and, and, and some people do it. And again, Trump is, the, is one of the people who most does this. When he sees a poll that shows him behind, he just doubts the veracity of the poll. Um, and essentially, that's, a, that's actually not a bad uh, strategy for dealing with the campaign narrative that's framed from the outside is just disputing its veracity, saying, I'm not behind. Um, but typically, campaigns will acknowledge the public scoreboard that these uh, 
polls put up and act as though they're 10 points behind, just like a football team that's 10 points behind in the fourth quarter will act as though it's 10 points behind. And even though that's not 100% accurate, as I indicated last time or two times ago, because ballot preference polls are actually asking a different thing than the scoreboard. The real scoreboard in elections is the number of votes. Ballot preference polls are asking you who you're going to vote for and are you going to vote. Uh, Very close, but not exactly the same thing. Um, Now, I put in bold and italics, trailing or leading can be good or bad, depending on how the campaign reframes it. Um, So the the campaign narrative that is created by uh, these external horse race polls can show you being ahead or being behind. And if you're ahead, that can actually be bad because if you're way ahead, then some of your supporters might be like, oh, yeah, I don't need to actually donate money. I don't need to go, you know, donate my activist energy. I don't need to go knock doors. I might not even need to vote because my candidate's going to win. Campaigns actually get concerned when they're too far ahead. And that means that they have to make sure that their messaging, as well as then their ground game, their specific pragmatic activities, ensure that they really do get the turnout that, that, that they want. Um, the, the, the same problem can exist when you're behind, far behind, because you, your uh, uh, supporters might get dispirited and not turn out to vote. On the other hand, you can turn being behind into an advantage because you can fire up your supporters and say, hey, we're behind. We got to like, you need to donate money. You need to, to volunteer. We need to be phone banking. We got to like, we got to get out the vote. So being behind can actually be an advantage. Um, it, it, it really depends on how successfully the campaigns can, can spin whether they're leading or trailing. Like you can't decide whether you're leading or trailing because that's what the external polls do. They, they give you that scoreboard but you can respond to the scoreboard uh, in various ways. But it is actually out there. It's it's a factor that you have to respond to. Um, Internal polls, of course, and I've talked about this, and again, I'll refer to the novel that you're supposed to read because it really, I think, shows exactly how this functions. They're just essentially valuable information it's the reason why campaigns spend precious money on these pollsters. Uh, and uh, the most important thing is not who's winning. They like to know that, of course, but how well the campaign is doing with different subgroups. And there's a certain uh, intuitive uh, understanding of which of those uh, subgroups are most important for victory in that district at that uh, particular time, but really just like looking across the board and saying, oh, okay, we're doing really well with uh, African Americans, but we're doing really poor with college educated whites. How do we like, how do we uh, make that up? Or is that make upable? Do we, should we try to uh, just really increase our support among African Americans to the, to the point where it goes from 80 to 95%? Or should we try to invest in uh, getting some of the support from college educated whites? Or should we invest more in rural areas or urban areas or among religious uh, um, conservatives or should we be going after people who are uh, unemployed like the the uh, subgroups and the, as a, as they're called the cross tabs the cross tabulations between different groups of people and what their level of support for your candidate is are extremely valuable information and they're uh, reliable pollsters who can produce the best subgroup uh, data that really shows the campaign what's going on out there in the world um, are extremely valuable. They make a lot of money and uh, they make a lot of money because they're useful in this highly competitive environment. Now, exit polls, and I talked about them last time, um, and so I'll just kind of go back over that same ground. Exit polls are intended to, to provide understanding of what happened. Um, we, we have now the actual count, the number of people who voted for each candidate, Um, And so we know who the winner and loser is and by how much, but who voted for the candidate and who voted against them? Who are those people? What factors led to their decisions? What issues were the most important to them? Um, This kind of information could potentially provide strategists with valuable uh, post-mortem analysis. Though, as I put in parentheses, sometimes controversial, and I talked about that in the last lecture, that most post-mortem or post-mortems can differ from each other quite drastically, all based on the same exit poll data. But it's better to have something rather than nothing. So instead of instead of the past essentially just being a blind uh, time where you can learn nothing from past elections, the campaign strategists would love to have uh, information about the past. They want information about the present. They want information about people's uh, ideas as well as their uh, candidate preferences. 
All of these different forms of public opinion are useful resources. And this is one of the reasons why the public opinion industry exists. It exists to help um, to give the information that makes democratic campaigning uh, a more effective thing. Democracy is a competitive political system. And in a competitive system, uh, using your resources to the greatest level of effectiveness is going to generate a higher level of success. And information, public opinion, inf uh, public opinion measurements is information that is a, an extremely valuable resource. You obviously need a good candidate, you need money, you need activist energy, you need a good party brand, you need uh, you know, a favorable electoral environment. There are lots of resources that go into winning a campaign. But absolutely one of those resources is information about where public opinion stands and what could be done to move public opinion. Now, in, in the next lecture, I'm going to look at shaping public opinion, and uh, part of shaping public opinion is, comes from campaigns, because that's what you're doing. When you're asking voters to vote for your candidate, you're attempting to shape public opinion, right? You're, you're attempting to get people who uh, are planning to vote for you to continue voting for you, so that's actually shaping their future to remain the same. You're trying to get people who are voting against you to change their minds, so you're definitely trying to shape and manipulate their opinion. And then you're getting people who are either undecided or on the fence to decide to vote for your candidate. A campaign is essentially an action, uh, an act, a prolonged act of manipulation, intended manipulation. That's what it is. And it's competitive, so both sides are doing it. It's not as though only totally self-serving uh, candidates try to manipulate the public. Every candidate is attempting to manipulate the public. Now, they might not like that word because that word sounds kind of evil and nefarious uh, and underhanded and disrespectful to people's uh, you know, personal choice, but that's what a campaign is aimed at. It's aimed at shaping public opinion. Uh, there is also other kinds of shaping public opinion that falls outside of campaign strategy, and I'll talk about those as well in the next lecture.